Hi everybody, Chris Kroll here with Craft Brewing Business, and we have a really awesome interview lined up today here at the Craft Brewers Conference uh, in 2019. Uh, we obviously have Charlie Papazian here, the founder and press president of the Brewers Association, and obviously the author of Complete Joy of Home Brewing, one of the legendary books of the industry. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Charlie. And, uh, and then we have Chris White, who is the uh, founder and president of White Labs. Um, you guys have obviously known each other for a while and have had kind of a, a business relationship, but it was not really something you were allowed to kind of promote or go in about. You know, you were, it was about this the Cry Havoc yeast strain, which is kind of a legendary yeast strain that you guys started working with in about 2007. Correct, yeah. Yeah. And now there's going to be kind of a rebranding and a relaunch of it with Charlie as the, putting his name on it for the first time now that you're kind of uh, away from the Brewers Association and can kind of do your own thing, which is pretty cool. So we wanted to kind of get into what this use is all about. So Charlie, I guess just take us back to the history yeah. of the founding of this about in, in 1983 and what's, what's unique about it. Well, kind of fast forward to 2006, 2007, Chris approached me and said, you know, I've heard you've been using this yeast for a long time. You know, let's take a look at it. Maybe we can do something with it. And I sent it to him, and he looked at it, and he said, "Why? Well, it looks pretty darn clean. you got a yeast here that's, and you've been keeping it how long? I said, well, since 1983. He said, well, would you consider, you know, us kind of making it available to other brewers? And I thought about it, and I, you know, I have a conflict with being president of the Brewers Association. I said, let's do it, but kind of under the radar kind of thing, because I didn't want to be promoting my name and affiliating it with too closely with, with uh, a, a particular company. Yeah, sure. It's a conflict of interest. So getting back to the yeast, uh, it goes back to 1983 when I was invited by the uh, St. Louis chapters of the American Society of Brewing Chemists and the Master Brewers Association of the Americas. They had gotten wind that there's this crazy group of people in Boulder, Colorado that started the American Home Brewers Association. They loved beer, they were really serious about beer culture, and they wanted to learn as much as possible, and they're making home brew, and they're trying to do a good job, and, uh, you know, they're, they're interested in beer. And, yeah. you know, it was that, that was a really weird thing, because. Americans generally were not interested in beer per se. They were interested in just drinking this light lager and there was no culture behind it. Yeah. So uh, I got invited and then um, I got uh, the guy who invited me from, he was worked for Anheuser Busch, you know, St. Louis. It was a chapter of Falstaff uh, across the river in Tennessee, and you know, I guess, or and, uh, Anheuser Busch in Missouri. And uh, they get together once a year for a joint meeting and uh, I got invited to uh, give a talk, and two weeks later, uh, you know, George, dear old George, George Charolomus, he uh, maybe he was drinking too much good beer, and he says, call me back two weeks later, says, maybe you can make a homebrew and we can serve it at the meeting. Wow. And I said, whoa, how many people? And he said, well, we might get 100 people or so, 80 people. You want me to make homebrew for you guys? Yeah. <laughs> And that was a pretty scary proposition. So I said, well, let me think about that. And I thought about it and uh, so he called, called me back again. He said, hey, how about we put your beer in cans? And I said, what? Yeah, we got a small canning line. We, we, I, we talked to Ball Corporation, they'll, they'll make the cans and blah, blah, blah. And I said, that sounds pretty cool. So here I was on the, on the spot, not only to give a talk, this is 1982. Yeah. Yeah, he's talking to me, and we had just barely started the American Home Brewers Association. I had known nothing but home brewing. You know, there were a few microbrewers around Sierra Nevada, Boulder Beer, and I count them on your hand. And uh, the state of the of the art of home brewing was at a point where the best yeast we could get was in a dry package, mm -hmm. and it was pretty poor. And some of it was lab labeled lager yeast, and it wasn't lager yeast. And some of it was ale yeast, and it would, may have been on the shelves for years, who knows. But, you know, that's what we were using. And it made good enough beer that we pursued the hobby, but it wasn't really good quality. And getting, uh, all of a sudden I was on the spot and I had to make good beer, and my friends at Coors Brewing said uh, they'd help me out with get, giving me some yeast. And so they dug into their frozen yeast bank and they gave me a couple of strains, one ale, one lager, 
I made a Scotch ale and I made a Bach beer, and they both turned out well. But I got these yeasts, and I got a little little test tube and a slant. And in those days, you know, what's a slant? You know, I mean, there were no books about yeast and cult cultivation. Yeah. And there's no information about this, so I got some quick lessons. Um, you know, and, and home brewers, if they wanted liquid cultures, we knew that there was a yeast bank in Maryland, and Siebel Institute had yeast, and you could get yeast from Europe. But it would cost, back, what, that's 40 years ago, practically, 35 years ago, 40 years ago, you'd spend a, at least $100 minimum to get a slant. Wow. And then what do you do with it? You know, so it was, pretty, you know, you just had to rely on, on dry yeast, so I, I, they gave me these yeasts. I cultured, I cultured them up, and I made the beer, and it was good enough that they invited me back to make another, make beer about three years later. So yeah. uh, it worked out well. I was freaking out about how the beer would taste, and uh, the St. Louis sent the kegs of beer, sent empty kegs, and I put the beer in the kegs, and they shipped them out to St. Louis, and they put them on their miniature packaging line, and um, which was pretty big actually they used half the beer just to fill the lines before it started coming out into the cans <laughs> um, I made uh, I guess uh, 60 gallons 30 and th 30 and 30 of, of each batch and uh, I kept that yeast culture going f for all those years mm -hmm. using the procedures that are outlined in my complete joy of home brewing not I never slanted I never acid cleaned I never uh, did anything except at one point I did give up because the yeast got infected with the wild yeast and I was getting phenolic characters in the beer. Mm -hmm. And so I just kept it on beer in the fridge with an airlock and just forgot about it for a year or two and used other, other sources wow. for uh, making beer. And then I said, well, I'm going to try it one more time. And so I recultivated, cultured it up again. It came back to life mm -hmm. and uh, I made a batch and it was clean. And to this day, I figure, uh, you know, the, the, it was a very mm. viable, strong yeast. I'm sure it's mutated over all these years. It's not the same exact yeast that I had before. Yeah. Um, but uh, the wild yeast were, they died off naturally. Yeah. Like, uh, because it, I just let it sit on, the, on beer for two years and the weak yeast went away and the strong yeast hung out. And actually, to add to that story, I had the experience of actually opening up a 25-year-old bottle of my homebrew that I used that yeast with about 10 years ago. And uh, on a lark, I tried to reculture the, the sediment, and it came back to life. Oh, this yeast came back to life. And I was really scared about brewing a five-gallon batch, because, you know, as home brewers, you know, you put in a day's work, and you make a batch of beer, yeah. and you throw it out, it's no good. And uh, it was good. Huh. And it was as fresh as probably the sample that I sent you may have been. Uh, no, I, it was from the ongoing culture. But that <coughs> that that fresh, that twenty-five year old re, rejuvenated yeast worked just as well. Well, yeah. It's so a that's really why we, strong strain. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I wanted to ask you, like, how I guess maybe surprised were you? Like, what were your expectations? And then what stood out to you about doing that at the beginning? You know, like testing it. Oh, uh, it's a good question. I mean. Um, uh, my first homebrew book was Charlie's book. I sure. bought it in 1988 in a bookstore in Davis, California. So that was my introduction to homebrewing and eventually what ultimately would be into the industry. So I had read all those recipes. I had made a lot of those beers. And so that's why I, I came to Charlie years later and, and asked him about the yeast uh, once I heard that he was using the same yeast over and over again. <clears throat> and it's things I talk about in a lot of lectures that very few people actually do. And he was doing before he found literature on it or lectures, right? And it's just good bi microbiology. It's maintaining a culture. It's brewing a lot. You really have to, yeast want to keep alive. And how they keep alive is when they're making beer uh, in our situations. And also, it really highlights what's so unique about brewer's yeast. They are robust. They're twice the size of baker's yeast, which was, were in those packets for the most part in the 80s. Right, the, yeah. they, they could label it brewer's yeast, but it was baker's yeast. And if you put those under the microscope, um, a lot of more baker's yeast, but if you put them under the microscope, they're half the size. So brewer's yeast is much bigger. It's been trained to be in beer 
uh, by brewers saying this beer tasted good, I'll reuse it. This beer tasted bad, I won't reuse that or I'll let it sit like you did. Very traditional things actually. Uh, and it made our brewer's yeast very robust, able to live in the alcohol, which the other wild strains don't do over time, mm -hmm. and have a bunch of DNA, which is one reason why the cells are bigger. So they have mutations uh, take a while to build up. And the, meanwhile, the yeast gets reused and reused and reused. So all of these things make uh, the brewer's yeast that brewers use super unique, uh, super, you know, domesticated, very different than any yeast out there in the wild. In fact, if you try to put brewer's yeast back out in the wild, they can't live. Um, and so it's really used to beer. So the stability part is exactly what Charlie took advantage of mm -hmm. and patience. Mm -hmm. You didn't throw that stuff away. Uh, and that's what everybody can do today, yeah. but very few people do it because there are companies that make it a little easier for you. But it's also, if you, if you enjoy it, um, you can keep a yeast going for a very long time. The reason we have the yeast strains we do today is because brewers reused it. Yeah. Uh, in thousands of different breweries around the world and a lot in Europe, um, created through those mutations and time, unique yeast strains. And this particular yeast strain, I guess two questions. First, where did that name come from? Is there a particular, I mean, is there, yeah, is there a, a story behind the name Cry Havoc? I was, uh, at a museum, Shakespeare Museum in, in Washington, D.C., and I was reading something about Shakespeare, and there was a little literature about the saying cry havoc in one of his Because it's a great line. <laughs> and, and so I thought, cry havoc was like, yeah, let's go get him. You yeah. know, let's do it. Let's do this thing. I like that. Uh, that was the spirit of what I took out from the phrase was, let's do this. Yeah. You know, charge, full speed ahead. And it sounds like it's a, like really versatile. Like you used it in lagers, oh, ales. Man. So I, is that? I, mean, I always recultured it in about a, in about a eight degree or ten thirty two, ten thirty five wort. It was yeah. always light malt, and I would really hop it. And uh, that was my my culture medium, and mm -hmm. then I went for men. That was how I did. But I used it in imperial stouts. Lighter lagers, Oktoberfest, pale ales, uh, Belgian spice beers, and you know I didn't get the I don't get the Belgian characters so much, but I did get the English fruity characters. Uh, the t the, it was a lager yeast. I I, I kind of dished the ale yeast because the lager yeast was much more interesting, and it had some house character. Um, but at warmer temperatures, I'd get ale fruitiness and it. And it would and it would lager really smooth um, and accent malt and be relatively pretty darn clean mm -hmm. overall. So you could accent the hops and the malt that you're those ingredients. And that's what was my my style of brewing. Rather than experimenting with different kinds of yeast, I was more of a you know the stick with one yeast and play with all the other ingredients and yeah. the other processes and, and learn from that. I mean, you can do it in different ways. So. Strong beers, barley wines, pale ales, light ales, English bitters, so it, lagers, German style lagers. Um, and it was really versatile, probably the happiest yeast ever on the planet. Because <laughs> every one of my recipes, almost every one of the recipes in my books, were those recipes were formulated and created, and the beer was created using the, that particular strain of yeah. yeast cool. over those years. Did you ever find out? If you just got lucky getting that yeast, or did the laboratory folks that you knew select this one for you because they knew something about it? Yeah, they knew what, what it was. Okay, so they knew about it. Yeah, would but be they good wouldn't tell me what it oh, okay. was. Okay, <laughs> you know, they said we can't tell you what this is. Mm. If you really want to know, you have to read my book, Microbrewed Adventures. There's mm. a chapter on gotcha. Okay, the mystery behind this yeast. Very cool. <laughs> um, and. Uh, yeah, the, the yeast is versatile. You know, in the beginning years, it, it, the earlier years, it, it, it pretended to produce sulfury notes. Mm. But those sulfury notes always would dissipate with time. Hmm. Either in the fermentation, if the secondary went long enough, or the lagering went long enough, or in the bottle. You'd open it up, you'd get this almost h 2 s kind of a bit of aroma. And, but a couple of weeks later, it was pretty much gone. And other some people who were real beer enthusiasts that could and had a good palate could detect that uh, 
sulfur house character, mm. but it was never a a negative. It just, it added complexity, which I, I remember the first time I visited Germany and I visited a lot of the small breweries in the hill in the countryside in Bavaria. And they were all kind of using the same yeast, but their beers were different because they had some house character from either their configuration of the equipment or their brewing process, or maybe they even got some other critters in there. But yeah. <laughs> it was, it made it complex. And I remember having a lot of, I've judged a lot of beer with a lot of judges, and that, that discussion about complexity and house character is an important aspect of what craft beer is all about. So then, uh Flash forward to today, where are we at with Cry Havoc? Are we going to be changing the name? You know, what's the what's the branding going forward and what's the message for our brewers today? Well, it's Charlie Strain, so. Well, yeah, we went back and forth. We came up with a few names and Joy of Brewing, Charlie Vampasian, uh, Homebrew Yeast. And we came up with a, a, my iconic fist bump. And right now we're going to work with Charlie Papazian, Fist Bump, 1983. That's awesome. So okay. Reflecting on when it was emerged in my life and Fist Bump being, yay, you're a winner. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so can a punk band take Cry Havoc as their name now? I feel like that's just a great name someone else can use <laughs> for something else. But uh, that makes so much sense for uh, taking what is already kind of imbued in the yeast itself, the history of it, where it started, and just yeah, putting that officially on it now as a part of, and it's only going to become uh, through White Labs if you're looking for it. Is that is that true? Yes. Like, okay. Yeah. Cool. And now, kind of fast forward to today. You know what? What should brewers today, home brewers, craft brewers, know about what White Labs is doing with Charlie here? What should we know about? How are you kind of promoting this, and when should it be sought out? You know, what's what's the story now? Yeah, it's it's great that uh, Charlie can use more of his uh, identity behind the strain because it is his strain. It yeah. is all of those recipes. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And it's fun to work with this yeast. It's one of many we make, so it's sometimes hard for a yeast to stand out. So I think that's nice. And uh, you can replicate those recipes. Uh, and what we try to do at White Labs is make pretty much everything we make for a professional brewery available to a home brewer. Mm -hmm. And it's really fitting for this yeast because that's how it began. And so it's available in home brew sizes. Uh, it's part of our core collection that uh, retail stores can, can buy every week that we make uh, about 70 yeast strains to a, to a target level every single week. Yeah. That's a big task in itself. And this is one of those yeast strains. Um, and. Um, it doesn't really sit out there as an identity of a lager or an ale, even though it's numbered as a lager, in, in really in respect for all the recipes that it was used for. Um, I've always liked, uh, for example, like Anchor Porter used to be lager yeast. I'm, I'm assuming it is now, but you know, I, I'm not talking to the brewers uh, right this moment. I realize recipes can change, but I always liked that they used the lager yeast, at least in the past on that, and it gave a really nice character to the porter. And uh, that's one thing, uh, that's just an example of one thing you can use. Um, Charlie's yeast for. Well great, is there anything else we should just mention about uh, the yeast or where people should be getting it or like seeking it out today? Well uh, we sell to a huge network of retail stores in the United States and abroad, uh, stores in Canada and, and elsewhere as well um, and also commercial breweries uh, also through some distributors but direct from us as, as well a lot of commercial breweries just buy direct from us and uh, we can talk about the yeast we can help develop the recipes a lot of based on what we've <laughs> yeah. read in charlie's yeah. books yeah. and made ourselves yeah yeah awesome and uh i guess i i sent you some notes on my experiences with the yeast and other characters that i've observed and that you'll have some kind of technical information yes. on a yep. website or an app somewhere in your yeah, there'll be more. Uh, we'll add. Uh, you've updated some of the technical information. Uh, sometimes our descriptions are pretty small, uh, but we'll. Uh, you gave us a lot more new information that we'll we'll update. Cool. Okay. Well, I think the only way to end this is with a fist bump, guys. So, nice. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> thanks. Thanks.